Today, we're going to have a special guest in the channel. This guy has walked the Kedrath Trail twice in two consecutive months. He may be the only person who's done that, and that's why we invited him to the channel. So, let's welcome our special guest, Antonio. Hi, hello, how are you all doing? Hello, Antonio, and thanks for coming to the channel. Yeah, sure, no problem, it's a pleasure. So, I wanted to ask you a few questions about hiking in Scotland that may be helpful to our viewers, if that's all right. Yeah, sure, go ahead, but you know, man, there's something I have to tell you. There's around 7.6 billion people in the world, plus minus one person, and boy, you get to invite me to your channel? I mean, seriously, sounds a little bit self-centered, don't you think so? Well, you know, the thing is, you're the only guy that has done the Kepras Trail twice in two consecutive months. That's why I wanted to have you on the channel. If I didn't know about this guy, I would think he's a little bit self-centered. <laughs> all right, all right, whatever. The only thing I want to ask before we start is, why do you have the fancy chair and you give me this shitty one? I mean, well, that's because I have back pain, seriously. And you know, your back must be so super strong after doing all this hiking and dragging and, and whatnot. So that's why. <coughs> oh shit. Okay, okay. Let's just start with the questions. Question number one. Just to say, we got into trouble with my wife, Caroline. And she just said that our special guest should be wearing the face mask because of COVID rules or whatnot. But you know, she's the boss in the house. So we have to obey. Okay, first question. What would you suggest me if I was to do the Kepras Trail? What? What do you mean, man? You, you were me. So you've done the Kepras Trail twice. What are you talking about? Boy, this is getting weird. Let's say that. What would you suggest someone who's planning to do the Kepras Trail? All right, got you. Well, my first advice would be that you listen to the people who have successfully completed the trail. And if this matters to you, Perhaps also listen to those who have done it covering high mileage per day. There isn't a must, but if that matters to you, those are the people you should listen to. Having said that, I think I will start by saying that, you know, when you hike in Scotland, the way marking is cars. So if you're not used to that, there's going to be a, an adaptation there required. When you do the Cape Wrath Trail, the way marking is simply non-existent. There's nothing at all. You need to find your way. And sometimes, uh, in some sections, there's just, there's not even a path. It's completely pathless. And you are either bushwalking or just figuring out like your ways. But when it comes to me, that was actually a good thing. Because I never had to be stressed again or worried about having missed a way mark or a signpost because there's none. So it was actually a good thing to tell you the truth. So just one thing to add here is that the path in the most remote areas, in those places where you need it the most, it won't be there. It will gradually faint until it disappears and you will get a feeling for that. You know it's gonna happen. And before you realize there's no path and you're on your own. So just remember that. I strongly recommend you having your phone and a GPS app. I use the OS Maps and I'm sure you can find any other that will do a great job or better job. That's the one I use, that's all. And I strongly recommend you having one or a GPS device or something. It will make your life a lot easier, especially in the remote areas. And even though with your phone and everything, you may struggle a little bit sometimes, but for the most part it will be fine. Maybe the struggle is more because you're not used to not having a path, because there will be none at all. So just remember that, be ready for that. Uh, for the most part, there is a path somehow visible, but there will be sections where there is absolutely none, and you need to be ready for that. The point is, this is to me a good thing, because if you are in those areas, you sort of have to earn it and then there is a bit of a feeling of achievement i have kind of a bit of a feeling of achievement because uh despite the fear i kept going it's almost guaranteed that the going will get very tough at some point 
and I'm sure it will take you out of your comfort zone sooner or later. So you have to be ready for that because it's going to happen. I also like to suggest people to aim at finishing the trail as soon as possible. And the reason behind this is that life on the trail in itself is tough. It's always harder than being at home, obviously. And so if the trail is already tough and you are on, on the trail, so to say, it's like the earlier you finish, the more chances you'll have to successfully complete the trail. Whereas, you know, if the trail in itself is already tough and you're taking too long to complete it, it's like the trail may get on top of you and what you want is to be on top of the trail. I need to get this thing done real quick or it will get me done. How about the terrain? What should we expect? Yeah, okay, so when it comes to the terrain, I would say for the most part, it's just bad or terrible. And so yeah, I mean, not necessarily for the most part, there are some paths, I think I just got used to it. But my initial impressions when I did the Kevras trail with my wife were that the, the terrain was pretty bad. It, the path were bad, it's, it was boggy, it was muddy, it was a swamp, there were rocks, and it was a combination of everything together. Just pretty bad. So let's face it, it's not that it is an easy path, because I'm mostly walking from stone to stone, because you never know how deep this thing is gonna be. Um... So my advice is the following. Just um, don't wish for a good path. Just accept that the path sucks, and then you'll be happier. Because if you're gonna be thinking of, oh, when this shitty path is gonna end, you're not gonna enjoy this trail. So you just better accept it, and whenever you get to see a good path or good trail or track, um, then just be super happy that you found it, but it's not gonna happen often, so just bear that in mind. Is it okay to do this route wearing trail running shoes? Yeah, absolutely. It's not only possible, but I would say very recommendable. The only thing is you have to embrace the wet feet philosophy. So you cannot use trail running shoes if you're gonna be worrying about having wet feet. Then I would say you better stay home or do a different trail if wet feet are a concern. I mean, having dry feet on this trail is almost, I would say, impossible. And I don't care what other people say online, that uh, they have dry feet with their boots and they're fantastic. I've never seen it. I've seen a lot of people wearing boots. They all have wet feet. Um, we talk about it and it's just the nature of this trail, but it's, it's completely fine. I'm talking about wet feet, not cold feet. Just make sure you get a good pair of merino socks and you'll be good to go. I've never had cold feet other than right after having crossed a river in the Cairngorms, for example, where the water was freezing cold. So for the next two, three minutes, um, I had cold feet and I had cold legs and I was cold all over the place. I would suggest you, if you want to get the feeling of walking with wet trail running shoes, well, it's just very easy. Just go home, make your trail running shoes soaking wet, put them in a bag, get them outside your place, put them on and just walk around the neighborhood. That will give you a good impression. It will make you realize that it's not as bad as you thought. But this is very subjective. Just give it a try and judge it for yourself. And how about wearing boots? Boots? Yeah, sure. A lot of people did it with boots. It's just not for me, but it's, it's, uh, it's completely fine. Just be aware of the downside of wearing boots. And if you're going to wear boots on the trail, I would advise you to pay a lot of attention to airing your feet often. Like take off your boots and let the air hit your feet and then put them back on and continue so that you avoid some complications with them and you can successfully finish the trail. Having said that, if wet feet are a major concern to you, I think you certainly have more chances to keep dry feet wearing boots than wearing trail running shoes. With your trail running shoes, you will have wet feet sooner or later every single day. There's no way around that. And there's no intention to, to avoid it either. When you're wearing your boots, 
you will have more chances to have dry feet. The problem I see is if you get your feet wet on day one, very likely your feet will continue being wet throughout the entire hike until the end and you will not have a chance to dry them. When do you think is the best time to do the Kefrath Trail? Yeah, sure. So I would say the best time to go and do the Kefrath Trail or hiking in Scotland in general would be May. May, mid June, because in April I have some friends who still encounter snow on the mountain passes. So maybe that's not a good thing for you. It can also still be quite cold in comparison. Many locals told me that April was uh, the best time to go and visit Scotland. But in my experience, I would say you have more chances to have milder weather, so to say, in May than in April. And, or otherwise, mid-June. I wouldn't go further than mid-June because I want to, to be 100% sure that I don't get into mid-just season. And just be very aware of that. Just whatever you do, anything, the worst weather is better than the midges. So whatever you do, just avoid the midges. Let's put it this way. Instead of telling you when is the best time of the year to go and visit Scotland, I'll tell you when you should never go to Scotland, the outdoors, I mean, and that is gonna be for sure end of June, July, August, and maybe half September. How about resupplying? What are your thoughts about resupplying? Yeah, so resupplying. You know, when I did the Scottish National Trail, having my wife sending me parcels from home was a pain in the ass. I was always faster than the delivery services and I found myself waiting for my parcel here and there in places where I could have easily resupplied. What screwed up my day today was my resupplying box that only arrived around four or five, I don't remember now. I wasn't gonna skip my mileage. So unless you have very specific food demands because you have allergies or you're on a specific diet or not, I would, I would recommend you just to resupply and root and just be easy and go by with the things you find and root and you'll be, I think it will be easier in general. Also the planning of the hike will be easier because you don't have to send boxes before you leave, you don't have to organize that. And that's another thing, if you want to send your boxes still, despite of what I've said, um, just make sure you include different type of food in your boxes. Even though when you're at home, you think you won't feel like having that type of food, when you're on the trail and you spend, especially if you do the Scottish National Trail, I mean, when you sp spend like maybe two, three weeks, you get tired of eating the same thing. So just make sure you have some variety in your boxes. There's just one thing to say, just avoid by all means Kilo Chewy, Kilo Q, whatever you pronounce that, the post office. I will ask Antonio to put the name on the screen because uh, he doesn't know how to pronounce it either. So um, just avoid that post office, man. There's horrible people there. If you go and check the Google reviews about Kilo Q post office, that there's nothing by what you really find there. It's just horrible people, man. How much daily mileage? would you recommend people to do? Yeah, so daily mileage. I would say if you're wearing boots and you're carrying around 20 kilos in your pack, perhaps 20 kilometers a day, that should, that should be a good thing, a good challenge. If you are not carrying so much weight and you have, I don't know, 12, 15 kilos in your pack, if you're still wearing boots, maybe 25 per day. If you're not wearing boots, I think you could do 30. Uh, you know, the, these are tough days, but I mean, you can do them for sure. Personally, I'm filming and I had to stop every few meters to just check the landscape, if there's some beautiful scenery that is worth filming, if there's a flower or a small detail that I want to capture for my video. So I'm constantly enjoying the landscape, regardless of the high mileage I put. I really enjoy enduring. So again, this is something very personal. I think what was doable is what I've told you. But for sure, you can certainly put 50 kilometers a day if you want to, if you are fit enough. But I would say for in general, 
you should aim at doing 30 to 40 kilometers a day when wearing trail running shoes and carrying around 12 to 15 kilos. And obviously then it depends on the weather you get because the weather will also alter the terrain. So it's all relative, but yeah, I think it's a good guesstimation. For those who are going to do the Kepras Trail, would you recommend them buying the guide? The guide, buying the guide. Um, I would say for sure 100% you do not need to buy the guide to successfully complete this trail. Now, if you wanna buy the guide because you enjoy reading about the trail that you're going to be doing soon, then yeah, by all means buy the guide. But other than that, you do not need a guide and I would certainly not carry the, the extra weight of the guide. Where I, um, my, my wife bought the guide and I read a couple of chapters, not entirely, but here and there I just read and I remember I enjoyed a little bit, just imagining, oh man, I'm going to be here and there. But, you know, these guides are not for me, but that doesn't mean they're not for you. So again, if you enjoy reading them and all, yeah, by all means, just go and buy the guide. When it comes to needing the guide, for, because you're concerned about finding your way, whatever, you just better have your navigation app and your phone, like running fine, and you're good to go. You don't need any guide. What section did you find the most demanding? The sections that I found more demanding are usually the pathless sections. Uh, on one hand, because you have to find your way. And secondly, because there's not a path, the, the going gets tougher. But then there's also the fact that these pathless sections are usually in places where you're more likely to encounter bad weather. So it's a little bit of a combination of everything together, but everything is doable. You just remember that it's one step at a time and that's all you need to care for. And you can finish this trail, no problem. Was there any section that was easy? Yeah. From Ulapul to all the way to Oikel Bridge, that's easy. That's pretty much just walking on good tracks for the most part and and then at some point it gets a little bit more like difficult path but still a completely defined path all the way to Uncle Bridge so that's an easy one you can put a lot of mileage there if, if you if you can physically and mentally no problem any other suggestions you would like to give our viewers yeah so I would say as I said before just take it one step at a time do not think or consider the number of days that I took to complete the trail or that someone else took or the daily mileage we did. Just do it your own way and enjoy the trail the way you like it. If you're like me and you love enduring and you enjoy the most when the going gets tough, then by all means enjoy it this way. If you're like other people that enjoy doing eight kilometers per day, then just do it that way. It's, it's completely up to you. Another thing to add here is if you feel like quitting, just stop, find yourself a pitching spot, feed yourself and rest and have a great time. Enjoy that day. And then chances are the following day, you look at things very differently because remember your emotions will alter your perception and your thoughts. So just give yourself an easy time if you can. And the following day, probably you will be motivated to continue. But don't just go and quit suddenly. Give yourself a day and only then decide whether you wanna quit or not. Another thing to say, don't quit based on things that people are telling you. Like, oh, I just come from this mountain pass and the weather is so horrible, I almost die. Okay, great, too bad for you. Just keep going, do your own thing. But don't just say, oh, I'm gonna quit because I'm gonna die there. Just don't listen to anybody, just see it for yourself, judge the conditions for yourself and make a decision based on your own observation. Forget about what people tell you. And finally, I wanted to say, don't quit because you're afraid of something. Instead, choose in the moment to be a brave person. Tell yourself, I'm not gonna quit because I'm afraid. Instead, I'm going to become brave. I'm going to face this thing. I'm going to be a brave person and just go ahead. 
obviously you need to assess the level of risk but one thing is the objective risk and another thing is the subjective fear an example of this is the falls of Glomach. Some people go there and freeze and they become completely paralyzed by fear. Objectively, it's just a path that anyone can walk. For the most part, there's nothing there to worry about. Just to put your feet together one step at a time and you're good to go and you go through the falls of Glomach. Actually, Antonio told me he was going to do a video about the falls of Glomach because he took some footage there to show it to people. Is there anything else you would like to add? A final comment? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that there is only one direction and you guessed it, it's always forward. Antonio, thanks a lot for coming to the channel and telling us about your hiking in Scotland experiences in 2020. It's been a pleasure having you around. Yeah, sure, buddy. The pleasure has been mine. Awesome. So, well, Thanks for watching and I hope the video has been helpful. Always forward. Bye.